I still carry that Erebus memory and I'll never get rid of it. And no one knows exactly what we did. Um, I, I guess I guess it um, I guess the effect it had was it slowly killed me from the inside from an emotional point of view. This is uh, Peter Malgo again folks. I still can't see very much at the moment. I keep you informed as soon as I see something that gives me a clue as to where we are. Where's the Erebus in relation to us at the moment? Left. About 20 or 25 miles. I'm just thinking about any high ground in the area, that's all. I don't like this. You're all clear to turn right. Five hundred feet. Four hundred feet. Go around power, please. Three hundred feet. Two hundred feet. At the time of the disaster, I was 22 years old. Yes, 22 and a half, actually. Hello. Contact with Flight 901 was lost mid-afternoon today. The aircraft had 257 people we'll on sit. board, including 20 crew. Today's flight was last heard from about half past two in the afternoon. At that stage, it was in the area of Mount Erebus, an active 4,000 meter volcano. Air New Zealand announced it had given the plane up as lost. The airline's Should chief I? executive, Mr. Murray Davis, feared just the worst. Just like everyone else in New Zealand, it was just absolutely just disbelief um, that I felt, and and also a creeping sense of foreboding that that in some form or another I may have been involved in in assisting, but never really thinking that I would be. But have you any possible explanation of this? No, we don't. There were heartbreaking scenes at Auckland Airport. Relatives arriving to meet passengers on the Antarctic flight were hustled away to a side room. There they received the dreadful news that the flight was long overdue and that the plane had almost certainly crashed. Now I, like the rest of New Zealand, was in, was in shock. We'd had a training day that very day at National Police Headquarters for the Disaster Victim Identification Team. And of course, there was a feeling coming through, even during that training, that when would we ever use this? But uh, little did we know that it was going to occur that very day. The worst disaster of any kind in New Zealand history. Surely they wouldn't send us to the coldest region in the world, to the Antarctic. I mean, I'd never been on snow or ice before. Well, just a few moments ago, we, uh, we received news that uh, they'd located the wreckage of the DC-10. He reported it was about uh, 2,500 feet up Mount Erebus, which is the largest mountain in the Antarctic, and uh, regrettably reported no sign of survivors. We got the news, I think about one o'clock it was confirmed that the uh, uh, wreckage had been found. We were fielding calls from people all over the world who wanted to know, you know, what's going on, is my uh, loved one involved? It was just go, go, go. And uniformed staff had been drafted in from across the street and yeah, everyone was answering phones and trying to answer questions. We didn't really have a great deal of information. Some were too shocked to react. Others Stuart Layton. The captain of the DC-10 was Jim Collins of Auckland.
Yes, sir. Years flying service with Air New I understand, sir, but... DC-10 and DC-8 pilot. This was his first flight. Thank you, sir. Type. The Airline Pilots Association had praised his ability, and they had asked him to be their association's technical director. Looks like it's all on. What do they want you to do? Uh, go out there, find, identify, and retrieve the bodies. One of the women killed was one of five sisters of all being stewardesses for Air New Zealand. She was Sue Marinovic, one of the organisers of a recent trip to Disneyland for handicapped and underprivileged children. The site itself is ice covered. Only mountaineers can actually work on the site. Within 15 minutes, I then had to make some urgent phone calls to uh, to my parents. Yeah, it's me. Can't go down as low as 30 degrees below. Yeah. My father answered the phone, and before I even said a word, he says, you're going, aren't you? Hannah! Hold up, girls. Kiss. I gathered some warm jerseys that I had, old jerseys, and went and said goodbye to my children. I genuinely wondered whether I would see them again. I'll be back before you know it. Hey. Off you go. We were very, very apprehensive. You had staff that were expert in their own fields in terms of search and rescue, and there were a number of mountaineers, and then an untried DVI team who'd never, ever used those procedures in anger before. Yeah, well, no, we're the other ones, all the And so therefore, you're having to wonder how you're gonna to work together. No one from the teams had been down to the ice before, so we had absolutely no idea what Antarctica was going to throw at us. We just knew it would be dangerous. I was actually feeling quite apprehensive. I'd realised that you know this was a um, career-defining uh, opportunity, but also it carried the. Uh, uh, the consequence if I messed it up. If I stuffed this up, I'm history. I didn't actually do any of the selection process, and I think that in hindsight, probably Stu was too young. For those sort of jobs, you need somebody, a cop with miles on the clock, and um, Stu didn't have it. But uh, I knew Greg from way back, and uh, I was pretty confident that he would be able to handle it. How you going? We're gonna need a good man to keep us on track at the coalface while I run things from McMurdo. No problem. We knew we had a job to do and I was prepared to do it, but um, I was concerned about, my, about, about safety, about not only my safety, about, and but other police officers. There was a feeling in myself of disbelief of actually being on the plane and heading down that way, saying, oh, I am going down there. It's, 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 we're on our way. This was a huge disaster. I knew that, a huge disaster. And I knew it was going to be an awful job, but it was still exciting. We didn't really know what had happened to the plane. We knew it had crashed into a mountain uh, somewhere in the Antarctic. I couldn't even visualise the, the crash scene. Uh, at that time. You never think it could happen to one of ours, do you? No. No, you don't. As I travelled down to the ice, it was a time of uh, contemplation, um, thinking about what lay ahead, thinking about uh, those who had died. I mean, the, the whole country was in mourning, and we were the same. And we rose merrily forward.
As we drew near to McMurdo, the captain of the Hercules drew our attention to Mount Erebus. And there in the distance was a, was a slight smudge on the side of the mountain. The reality of it hit home that here was a, a big, huge airliner um, which had disintegrated. All it looked like was a little cigarette smudge on the side of the mountain. And that was a very, very moving moment. There it was, a fallen bird in the times, time had come. Good God, it's in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing. There was a huge mountain, just snow and, and, and rock and a bit of smoke coming out the top. It's really, and there was nothing. You're all very apprehensive about what you're going to encounter down on the ice and think about what you were letting yourself in for. I knew I was going into danger, absolutely. There's nothing worse than the fear of the unknown and we were heading into the unknown. Peter, welcome to the Madhouse. As an accident investigator, I felt, let's get on and find out what had happened and gone wrong. Pack your bags and go to Christchurch tomorrow. I thought you were heading off to the ice. Oh, I'm just here to pick up 901's flight plan. Has been any news? We'll figure it out. I was told by Air New Zealand that I was going to join the investigation team uh, at the request of the Airline Pilot Association and also the Inspector of Air Accidents. There all sorts of wild ideas. People were in just total disbelief. I thought that uh, something has gone horribly wrong for a crew that I had known in the Air Force and had a reputation in New Zealand of being cautious, well-trained, always planned their flights well. What on earth would have caused them to run into a mountain? Air New Zealand flight operations staff trying to work out, like we all were, what on earth's gone wrong. Well, how significant? Just two degrees of longitude. Okay. Jesus. We had one meeting at the New Zealand offices, and as far as we were led to understand at that stage as the whole team, they had no information as to what might have been a probable cause. All right, men. Let's go. We thought, well, we're now going to get off the plane in Antarctica. And so we all put all this great big heavy weather Antarctic gear on and we were a bit like the Michelin men. I thought you'd open the door and there'd be snow um, blowing, and there'd be winds howling. It would be just like a, like a blizzard. <laughs> Welcome to Antarctica. And there was this most wonderful day, the bright blue sky. An American commander was there with his sleeves rolled up. <laughs> so that was our first lesson is that, you know, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. So um, I think we were a little bit overdressed. 
Very pleased to meet you, Jim. Hi, hey, long flight. Let's head on up the base and get some hot food into you. They were very helpful. They said to me, if we got it, you want it, you got it. Everything, anything we wanted, if they had it, it was ours. And they couldn't have been more generous, more helpful. Star lifters, got extra Hercules, anything at all. We were under a lot of stress. The sea ice was breaking up. We expected the sea ice to break up within about a week of us arriving there. And once the sea ice broke up, we knew that the Hercules couldn't land. They couldn't take the bodies back to New Zealand. You are about to go out into the most inhospitable place on the planet. If you don't know what you're doing, the results can be deadly and immediate. I was worried that when we got up onto the mountain that we wouldn't be able to handle it. And um, cops being cops, um, if something can go wrong, it will. Mountaineers are up at the wreckage site right now, marking it with flags. This is why you're here, gentlemen. Green flag means a body or portion thereof. The bodies will be frozen. They might be buried in the snow or hidden in crevasses. Red flag means a crevasse. Don't fall in. Easy to say, hard to do. Now, I know you've got a big job. I don't envy you it. Those two or three days before we went to the mountain were very trying. There was uncertainty of what we were going to face. This, this has got nothing to do with the body recovery. I thought I could cope with that without any problems. Um, but I was just concerned about the conditions. Scattered around the site are a couple hundred of these little fellas. They might have been damaged on impact or in the fire. They might explode. You right, mate? Safety is the first priority. You've been on the snow before. You're unsure, walk away. It's mostly just common sense. You'll be okay. Yeah. Don't take chances. We had no doubts in our mind we were in a, an absolute survival situation. Or you're wondering, oh, do we really need to be here? Do the bodies really need to be recovered? Um, is, is this beyond our capabilities? Um, and, and some people were of the view that it was. Are you sure we're the guys for the job? This is serious stuff. We're here now, Greg. We're committed. We're completely untrained for this environment. Greg and I had a conversation um, and he said, you know, this is madness. Um, he said, we've got no business being here. Um, we don't know, we're not mountaineers um, because we're all street cops. I was concerned, there's no doubt about that. I was genuinely concerned about, I envisaged us hanging onto the side of a mountain and never having been in snow or ice before, I thought, this is madness. Look, we can make it work. I can run the site with you, mate. Double shift sort of thing. Yeah, that could work. Good on you, mate. Can I get a show of hands from the DVI team? Who has had some survival training in the snow? Yep. All right, Stuart, down on your haunches. On your back. And so the decision was made to have us assessed as to our capabilities. We're learning to walk on in snow and then on ice. Just concentrate on the technique. Keep that in your mind. They would lay us on our backs. Don't panic, you'll be fine. All right, you set? All right, guys, let them go. And just let you go. It just really dug into us that we were going into. This was not a game. This was no joke. Uh, this was serious. It was life-threatening. And we had to um, be prepared to survive and be disciplined to survive uh, in that type of environment. We were the first officers to, to head to the mountain. 
As we neared the mountain, it was shrouded in, in mist and fog, and the helicopter pilot couldn't find the crash site. Then there was a, a clearance, a clearance, a sudden clearance, and he dropped straight down. that the pilot was not 100% confident to go in and actually land on the mountainside. All right, this is where we get off. Is he going to land? Because of the weather conditions, the pilot's going to maintain a hovering position. I'm part of the ground. from the rotor blades. Up you go, son! Everything was white, and so you just had to jump into a white void and, and have faith. As the junior boy, I was the, the last one on, and consequently the first one out. I was extremely apprehensive. What am I going to see? How am I going to cope with what I'm going to see? Will I be able to do the job that I'm asked to do? Uh, because you just don't know, no one's experienced it before. And it's the fourth biggest um, air disaster in the world at that time. The sight that um, greeted us was just, it was unbelievable really. The experience I'd had dealing with death and that really you couldn't prepare for what we saw. Um, it was just a scene of utter destruction, both um, human and aircraft. It was overwhelming to see so many fellow New Zealanders, human beings and others, um, other persons from other countries also, um, lying there. It was hard, it was, it was hard to take. It was horrific. The whole area was covered with, um, with bodies and they were mangled and um, the whole thing was just uh, a shambles. It, it, was, uh, yeah, it was the worst sight that I'd seen. There was a lot of mutilation, a lot of bodies. It was just grotesque and it was, it was just overwhelming. I personally felt a little bit out of my depth. I couldn't walk with the other two. I just had to be alone with my own thoughts and I also had the feeling I don't belong here. This is quite foreign, what am I doing here? You know, it's, um, this, is, this is for where the big boys are. Let's take it one step at a time, Stu. 
and you just suck it up and you say this is reality, this is it. Chopper will be back shortly with the rest of the crew and supplies. What time you got? It's just gone 2 a.m. How are you feeling? We can do this. Mm. Good luck. Bob Mitchell had to return to McMurdo to coordinate the operation from there. Stu Leighton and myself had to busy ourselves because the rest of our team hadn't arrived. You lead a hand? And Stu and I were the only two there. Should do it. We should hurry up. I'm starving. The son of a chopper. Should be here shortly. We could be here for some weather. Let's go. We had only been on the mountain a short while and we were soon to learn how quickly the, the, the weather could change. There was lots of light metal lying around and the wind would pick this, this stuff up and it would just fly around in the wind. And you know that you're on the slope of a mountain and you're thinking, is this tent going to stay? Is it going to be blown away? Are we going to be rolling down the side of the mountain? It was absolutely frightening, the, this, this, the strength and the force of these winds. I can honestly say that I was wondering whether we were going to survive, and I was praying. Um, I remember it. I thought, my goodness, if this is the way that it's going to continue routinely and this is the way it's going to be, I don't know whether we're going to get out of this. And, and, and that's when I had my first serious doubts of whether we were going to get out of that alive. It's continuous 24-hour sunlight. Uh, it's quite an unusual, disorientating sort of uh, feeling. The campsite was right next to the actual crash site itself. And one of the first things that was built when I was there was an actual helicopter landing pad. And um, we'd built a snow toilet, an igloo and we'd carve the little bench in a little big hole, you know, just like the outside dunnies. Some perfume from the aircraft we found and we put that in there. Yeah, it was, it was very effective. Right, good reference point here. It's the uh, tail fuselage up here on the, on the side. Now, red one one, obviously. It's down the bottom here and we're going to be working across the mountain. So, left to right, that way we can go up and down all the time. Now, the crash site itself, it was awesome to look at. And I must say, I did have a moment of dread there because the moment of truth was getting closer for me uh, to get stuck into this DVI procedure. So yes, I was probably a bit nervous at that point. Okay. And with that in mind, be really careful with all these jagged bits of metal we've got all over the place. There's a, there's a lot of hazards, so just watch yourself, okay guys? How are we doing? Yeah, good, good. We'll have uh, four teams, four men to a team, comprising of uh, two police, a mountaineer and a photographer, and they'll rotate continuously. Two teams on, two teams off, 12 hour shifts. I'll run my shift. You got here first, you guys take the first shift. Fine. Greg was on site coordinator when Greg was there. I was on site coordinator when Greg left. And uh, yeah, so 
I was in charge of it and I had to make sure that the thing ran properly. Now the site's a grid marked by the black flags. I've marked them here on this map. Now each grid has to be signed off before moving on to the next. What about when it's just parts of bodies? No, fair point. Um, each body part gets its own tag. Any questions? All right, let's go. I felt like I had a responsibility. Um, and I, I was determined to, um, to get it moving. Did we get some bag ready? And everyone had the right attitude. Careful. It was a real New Zealand attitude. Let's get this job done. Two, three. You can take one from the other side, mate. There were some horrendous sights. Decapitated bodies, there were people torn apart, there was guts, there was brain. It was just awful. The bodies went from being totally whole all the way to the most, um, um, most disintegrated bodies you'd ever hate to see. Over. Legs and feet, arms. Male, isn't it? I don't know. And you couldn't have just assumed that they had come from uh, bodies which were lying nearby, because they may not. And, and then that was all part of the process. The way that I could tell whether it was male or female was by their hands you'd be looking at their painted fingernails and, the, and, and, the, and the, their wedding rings and all the rings on their hands, and there were smaller hands, painted um, nails. Got it. Holes. Okay, take your end down. Hold it up, hold it up. Holes. Yep. Nice and easy. Take your end down first. I don't think I could have retained my sanity if I had have had an honest belief that people survived that crash or that they suffered in any way. You all right? Yep. Lift your end up a bit, mate. Yep, good. Down easily. To me, they were always people. They were always someone's mother, father, brother, sister, or whatever. Let's get in there, eh? All oh, right. We're going to have to lift the one up, boys. She's jammed in there. All right. Okay, we got it. One, two, three, go! Hang on, Sue. Hang on. Hang on. These bodies were frozen solid. Whatever grotesque shape that they landed in, that's what they froze at. You okay, mate? Yeah. How are we gonna get that? In here. One, two. So we had to have larger bags manufactured in New Zealand and, and rushed to the site. The eyes of, of New Zealand were on us, and to a certain extent, the eyes of people overseas were on us. This hand next here. And I wanted to um, return these people to their loved ones as soon as we could. We've got a radio message back that found the flight recorders. Peter, yes. can you bring those over here? Did they have any technical problems? Did they have any other warnings? Did they have any issues on navigation where they thought they were? Well, this is uh, Peter Malgo again, folks. I still can't see very much at the moment. I'll keep you informed as soon as I see something that gives me a clue as to where we are. Is that coming over? Yeah. Where's the arrow in relation to us at the moment? Left. About 20 or 25 miles. Well, left, Gary. I'm just thinking about any high ground in the area, that's all. I thought 
They were here. I don't like this. The crew did not see the mountain till the last moment. In fact, they didn't see it, even then. The only warning they got was a ground proximity warning saying, pull up. Why they didn't see the edge of Mount Erebus, we couldn't work out at that stage. 500 feet. 400 feet. Go around power, please. 300 feet. 200 feet. The campsite was getting slowly bigger and bigger, and the more tents were being erected. You had quite a lot of people coming and going. And I did think at the time it was a little odd that Air New Zealand people were on the site. The scene today would be probably treated as a crime scene, but in those days it wasn't. And it was made very clear to us uh, during our briefings before we went up there that we were not investigating and that we were there purely for body recovery, and we knew that. Two, three. Oh. What have we got here? It's Captain Collins. He was in his uniform, virtually, he was virtually unscathed, his body. He was lying on his stomach. All right, well, let's bag him, get him out of here. And there was this. It was a ring binder notebook, which had Jim Collins' name on it. In the first five or six pages, there was technical writing. Uh, I knew nothing about flying an aircraft, but I knew that it was, that's what it would probably be. And I thought, well, this is important. And so I took it up to the top of the crash site. We went to, the, to where that property was and made an inventory of all the property. Now, that uh, ring binder um, wasn't there. I'd love to be able to change for dinner. I'd set up a brush in my teeth. Mmm. This gets better and better with age. Our hands became full of grease, human grease, because a lot of the bodies were burnt. It's all yours. Jeez. We ended up having the one set of gloves the whole time we were there. Ah. Ah, geez, mate. So they were baked full of, you know, the fatty human remains, uh, the, the soot and the, and the wreckage, whatever, and you were having to use those some set of gloves to put food in your own mouth. It was 24 hour daylight. You would constantly see the body that you were dealing with yeah, so I, I, I did not get much sleep at all during the whole time. Burst bloody things! Bugger off! Bugger off, get out of here, you bastards! Bugger off! Bugger off! Get out, you bastards! The main thing for me was the birds. Piss off! They never shut up the whole time. They squawked the whole time. They circled the, um, the crash site. They were, um, obviously they'd got to the bodies before, before we got there. They tormented me. Pull the pin. Pull the pin. Okay. We did ask the Americans for some help. Try to keep your hand as far away as you can. Yeah, it is. It is? They did send a rocket launcher up. 
<laughs> that they thought might be useful. Hey. <laughs> and I can remember the debate that we had with all these gung-ho cops, uh, you know, with a 50-50 sort of shall we or shan't we? I got no idea. Okay. You know, let's assemble it, let's read the instructions and put this thing together. How do you sign it? I don't know. And, um, you know, wiser heads ruled. <laughs> The engineer said, no, you can't use that because of all these cylinders on the side. Okay, okay, you know, it could cause an explosion or whatever. You don't want to bring down the bloody mouth, do you? And we used up a lot of our energy trying to protect the bodies from, um, from, from what the birds were doing. Eventually, we decided that we would bury the bodies again so the birds couldn't get to them. And it worked. Always, in an accident, um, any passenger cameras on board are used as information. It looks like fuel on the window, which means this must have been taken at the moment of impact. They had no warning at all. The pictures were developed which surprisingly showed proof that the aircraft was flying in totally clear conditions. You could see clear horizons both sides of the aircraft at the time of impact. That caused us to be puzzled as to how you can run into the mountain in what appears to be totally clear air. Totally perplexed and uh, puzzled. Look. This is your Mount Erebus on a bright, sunny Antarctic day. This is the same mountain five minutes later. And five minutes after that. The atmosphere is so dry, the snow is so dry, you get no reflection from it, so you get no depth perception and you don't know whether you're looking at a, a piece of rock at the end of your arm's length or the side of a mountain 10 miles away. You've got no depth focus, no depth perception at all. The crew were absolutely, totally unaware of the rising ground in front of them until the ground proximity went off. days that I spent on the crash site at Erebus uh, was the hardest I've ever worked in my life. I've never been under such stress. Well, there was enormous pressure on us to get those bodies up and out of there. There were places on the site where you just, just didn't look right. with the holes up there, you don't know how deep they are. We checked everything out and we abseiled down all the crevasses. There were bodies we were chipping out of the ice 
um, parts of the engine, for example, must have been exceedingly hot, and they'd, they'd just melted their way right through the ice on this glacier. And of course, one of the bodies had followed it, and it was completely packed in the ice, and it took us ages to chip it out with our ice axes. The crevasses were reasonably wide at the top, but many of them narrowed down, and you had two ice walls getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And if you were silly enough to fall down one of those and get yourself jammed down there, you, you might die before somebody pulls you out. Slope. There'd be two teams working and, and, and slowly going through and eliminating all the grids for where the bodies were. whether you're dealing with a car crash or whatever, one of the first things you try and do is dehumanise the scene. Because you can get overwhelmed by the fact that you're dealing with, with people. and it was just a blank page and just nothing on there and nothing ever would be written on there. I'll never ever forget that as long as I live. Those were the biggest mental challenges combined with the physical environment um, and it was overwhelming at um, it's, it, it's stages, it, it truly was. you becoming more and more tired as you were being overcome by the trauma of it all and your body started to shut down and your reserve started to deplete. And it was the hardest thing was to motivate yourself mentally to carry on and to, to keep on doing your role, um, not wanting to let the team down. And you're starting to get run down. It's just started to take its toll after a while. Come on, come on, hey. come on. Take it easy. Good. Come on, come, come on. Hey. hey, calm down, okay? Time for a break. We, we were, you know, we'd been working so hard and uh, it was having an effect on us, obviously. Mm. One of the reoccurring thoughts that just came into my mind when I'm on my downtime, you know, looking at this, this wonderful view and trying to reconcile on that with the, with the devastation and the carnage that had just taken place. trying to cope with um, such a job. I used to just turn away from the site, the crash site, and think of my family. And um, I used to think about the, it was summer of course, and I used to think uh, just down below us we had a, um, a sports ground. And um, I used to envisage the, the cricket players there, I used to see every Saturday. And I was thinking that's what they'd be doing now.
I'll report on the news, Sir William. Oh, Peter, sun in the snow. I got back to New Zealand from the accident site. We had a situation where, from the chief executive downwards, they were trying desperately hard to protect the company's image and its future. Well, he hit at two and a half thousand feet. What height should he have been operating at? We establish a minimum altitude of 6,000 feet. We are aware that the wreckage was sighted at two and a half thousand feet. Was the vast covering? Well, was Mount Erebus it's right there. On the schedule? Mount Erebus oh, you reckon? Yeah. It must have been flying too low. It stands to reason. But it's a sightseeing tour, for God's sake. And there are rules and protocol. <laughs> right. And what's this then? Sea Antarctica from 2,000 feet. It's what people were paying for. The aim was to take passengers down there to see things. And uh, this crew, along with other crews that went down there, found a way to get down below 16,000 feet when they thought they were in the clear. Look, mate, we're all on the same team here. No one wants this mess to get any worse than what he is. Right? If you've got a problem, then I suggest you take it to the appropriate person. So there's no suggestion that he's off track? There's, the suge there's no suggestion we can make whatsoever in this matter. It was almost a them and us feeling. Murray Davis is a very blunt gentleman. He had worked his way through the company to get the chief executive. His heart and soul was in the company. Murray. He felt anger at the pilots because we were in danger of damaging the company's image. Air New Zealand's image was going to be the loser. And um, it would be far easier if we left the decision-making process to the airline and the government. In very blunt terms, he put it that way. Much more colourful language than I'm using. Goodbye. I'd actually hit the wall. I worked to the point of um, exhaustion, um, both mentally and physically. <laughs> Stu! Just about the end of our tether at that point, we had worked so hard. Of course, you always remember the last one. There she was, and perfectly preserved. Poor girl. One of the women killed was one of five sisters of all being stewardesses for Air New Zealand. She was Sue Maranova, one of the organisers of a recent trip to Disneyland for handicapped and underprivileged children. It's the worst I've ever felt in my, my whole life. Yeah. I had nothing more to give. Nothing. Hey, Stu! Out here!
Here he is. Yeah. Get that in you. Okay, boo. Only the best for us, mate. We'd found all the bodies on site. We'd done all we could do. Lying over the site were all these bottles of wine, unbroken. Might as well. Only got a waste. At the completion of the body recovery operation, um, we had a little celebration. All right, get ready. Are you set? Yeah. Ready? Had a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, a session, you could say, to l let a bit of the stress out. There we go. There we go. There we go. We needed to let off steam, and it was a good way to let off steam. There were quite a few sliding down the mountain on body bags. Yeah, yeah, plastic body bags. Just a bit of fun. Mm. It was an amazing effort, really, even if I say so myself, under those conditions. But it was a trying time. Our thoughts had turned to home and getting back, getting off the mountain. Mate, you look like shit. Can you smell worse? <laughs> Taxi's here. I got it. When we got back to McMurdo, Al and I were met by the fire chief and he took us to the fire station and there was this huge tank of warm water. Bullshit. Come on, guys. Jump in. Dirty, blackened faces, grease all over, you know, we were really filthy. One, two! Oh. And it was just bliss. I've never had bliss like it before. It was just wonderful getting into that, plunging into this warm water over my head. Oh. We had basically a fortnight uh, to get in, get the job done and get out. My main concern was that one or more of the guys would be injured in the, in the process. But I, I was hugely relieved when the last one came off the helicopter, I can tell you that. Yeah. You know, each of those families that lost somebody on Erebus grieved for that individual family member. I grieved about the whole lot. And I can remember thinking, oh my God, I hope this is not going to traumatise me. I hope this is not going to absolutely screw me um, when I get back, because uh, I knew it had the potential to do so. And unfortunately, it did. Arriving home, it was a good feeling, but I thought I could get home and get back to normal um, quickly, but it just didn't work that way. Um, I couldn't really get it out of my mind. And I went back to work and I wondered why I couldn't um, do what I used to do or perform at work like I used to. But I, I was just mentally and physically, um, I was, I'd had it really. People just could not comprehend or realise what we had gone through. You had the story in you of what you'd seen, what you'd experienced, and you couldn't share it with anybody in a meaningful way because they just couldn't understand. We were invisible after Erebus. Um, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody spoke to us about it. Um, certainly, uh, I didn't. I wasn't contacted by anybody. I go. I didn't have a debrief uh, after I got back to New Zealand, and so you know, we, we just sort of faded away.
I thought we deserved better than what we got. And no one wanted to know. And no one went out of their way to um, support us in that respect. And that was devastating. The Chief Inspector of Air Accidents report ended up being very controversial amongst most of the pilots. He ended up saying the cause of the accident was the captain's decision to continue flying at low altitude and conditions of poor visibility. Not all of us agreed with the findings that he wrote, but when you put it in the context of the technology at the time, and the legislative system we lived in at the time, there was a conclusion that he could support. As you're about to give to this Royal Commission of Inquiry concerning the DC-10 disaster at Mount Erebus shall be the truth. The crew were not monitoring their actual position in relation to the topography adequately. Not been suggested, has it, that the safe thing might be to put the whole uh, blame on Captain Collins. I can assure you it's not a sad. You took some envelopes of material back with you to New Zealand. Well, that's news to me. They were taken without my knowledge and without my permission. Does that strike you as a remarkable sequence of errors? Yes, sir, it's very disquieting. Justice Mann was highly critical of the post-accident conduct of Air New Zealand. He described the decision by Murray Davis to destroy so-called irrelevant documents as one of the most remarkable executive decisions ever made in the affairs of a large New Zealand company. He still believes that you're holding one or two cards under the table. I don't believe that. The company's got all its cards out. There's nothing being held back. As far as I'm aware, yes. Well, then, how do you suppose the pad of papers secured by the ring binders uh, could have uh, disappeared? I would have no idea, sir. Um, as I say, unless they were removed because they were damaged. There was a documentary, and at one stage, Justice Mann is holding a ring binder and rubbing it on his face, and it's Captain Collins' ring binder, and he's asking the witness where do you suppose the pages have gone? I know very well that we saw that writing in that ring binder. And I thought, well, this isn't right. I, I couldn't let it go because I thought, well, 257 people died here and I'm not gonna let this go. Um, I'm a police officer and I believe in honesty. I wanted to see justice being done. So I went to um, Gordon Betty, who had assisted Justice Mann at the Commission of Inquiry. He came to Wellington and spoke to me. And um, he said, well, this is just what we've been looking for. And Justice Mann wrote to me and said, the ring binder that you saw, and I've still got this letter, contained the, would have contained the coordinates that Jim Collins was given at the briefing, um, which were incorrect. There's quite a few trigger points that, that I have that, that will instantly bring this uh, Erebus memory back to me and I'll never get rid of it. I see a, a older ladies' hands. Um, I, you know, I look at their hands and I look at the rings, I look at their painted fingernails, I look at those sort of things um, and I'm instantly back there again. Smells and, and um, you know, going past a, the ferry terminal that I do in Wellington and I can smell diesel or whatever and I'm, I, I'm straight back on Erebus. I still get recollections of the crash site and uh, the greasy 
mess that um, was in all the property and stuff like that. Well, it's affected me to this day. Um, I thought it wouldn't because of what I dealt with over the years. I mean, I had 14 years police experience at that time. You can't get away from it. That was a huge honour. I actually uh, am very proud of that medal because it associates me with all those guys on the mountain. I think that's brilliant, yeah. I'm really proud of that. Fantastic. Mm. And I was very grateful for that. And uh, I know everyone else was too. You couldn't, you couldn't not be proud of it. We, we cleaned the site up. We cleaned the site up uh, and, and we got all those bodies back to their families, which was damned important to the families. To finally, finally someone to come up and say, you know, you guys did a, a great job and we want to formally recognise that. It sort of, it sort of, um, it sort of finished off the process and, and, and it actually in some respects you know, gave me a bit of closure in terms of well, someone's finally acknowledged what we did was worthwhile. And it, that's made me at peace a lot, um, it truly has. song and a smile 